I'm Biddy Martin, president of Amherst College, and I want to welcome you to this first in a series of programs designed to help us think through the pandemic. And we're in for a big treat today. We have with us uh, Joseph Stieglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist and a winner before the Nobel of the prestigious John Bates Clark Medal, which is awarded to an American economist under the age of 40 for significant contributions to economic thought. But Joe is well known for pioneering work on asymmetric information. And his written work focuses on income distribution, risk, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomics, and globalization. He's the author of many, many books and several bestsellers as well. His most recent titles include People, Power, and Profits, Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent, Rewriting the Rules of the European Economy, Globalization and Its Discontents Revisited, Anti-Globalization in, in the Era of Trump, and the Euro, How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe, also a memoir recently published. At Amherst, Joe Stieglitz majored in economics and math. He went on to get degrees from MIT and um, from Cambridge. He is currently um, co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD. He is also the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. We're so delighted to have Joe here and to hear from him. And he will be interviewed by Dave Novak, a trustee of Amherst College, uh, a graduate with a degree in economics who received an MBA from Harvard Business School with honors. Uh, Dave Novak was appointed to the board in 2018. He is the co-president of the private equity firm Clayton, Dubillier, and Rice. He is based in London and has responsibility for CDNR's European business. He's a member of the firm's executive and investment committees. And in 2009, Dave Novak was selected to join the Forum of Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum. We're delighted to have you both. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you, Biddy, and welcome everyone. Joe, I'd just like to extend my thanks as well for you giving us your time today in this in incredibly different times for all of us. And I know everyone in the Amherst community really appreciates hearing what you have to say and what you think about the crisis. So before we dive into the topic at hand, how's lockdown treating you? Where are you sheltered in place? Have you picked up any new hobbies? Have you dropped any hobbies? Well, uh, I'm sheltered in uh, the, our apartment in the Upper West Side. Uh, it looks over the Hudson River, so that's uh, 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 very nice. We can look down at the flowering trees that I won't be able to uh, enjoy as I do uh, normally in the spring. Um, I had thought when this uh, sheltering place began that uh, I'd have a lot of time to catch up and read some of the books that I uh, haven't had a time time to read, but actually it's turned out to be an incredibly busy time. Um, I continue to teach uh, uh, my students, my graduate students on Zoom, uh, and um, there's a, a, a lot of going on all over the world, um, uh, uh, and in the United States, you know, discussions about uh, shaping the uh, recovery package uh, didn't go very well. We'll probably come to talk about that. Uh, talking about initiatives at the IMF, uh, the G20. So um, there's just been a lot of activity. So I, I don't think I've ever been busier. Uh, the, the fun thing about Zoom is, uh, you know, it used to be uh, to get a taste of what was going on in the world, you had to spend a lot of time in the airplane. Uh, and uh, right now, I can go in the same day, uh, have a morning meeting uh, in Beijing, uh, an afternoon meeting in Bolivia, uh, an evening meeting a discussion with some journalists in Australia. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, 
uh, moment in, in our technology. Well, thanks for that. And we might come back to that uh, later, actually. Um, before we dump into the economics, uh, I learned just last week that in addition to all your economics research, you actually done a bunch of research actually on diseases and epidemics. Tell us about that. What was the driver of that? What'd you learn? Well, there were actually several uh, motivations. Uh, one of them was when I was chief economist of the World Bank, uh, one of the uh, important aspects of uh, development is improvements in health. And uh, so one of our uh, major programs uh, was concerned with improving uh, uh, the health of developing countries, uh, doing something about contagious uh, diseases. And then uh, roughly at the same time, uh, the, the, the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic was going on. And um, the, the mathematics, you know, uh, contagious diseases are about human interaction. And economics is about human interaction. Uh, there are some very nice models, uh, mathematical models describing uh, contagion that I found uh, fascinating um, at the time that I was doing my work uh, 25 years ago. And of course, uh, those models have now been uh, brought out of the closet by everybody as they try to understand uh, the, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, I have to say, because I was so familiar uh, with those models, uh, I had an inkling that things were going to evolve uh, in the way that they have uh, evolved. Uh, the, you know, the exponential growth uh, of, of uh, the number of people in, with the disease. Uh, one could uh, feel it, one could see it coming, one knew in the equations that it was uh, a very good chance that it was there. And um, that led us perhaps to uh, uh, be a little bit more cautious in the beginning, uh, buy a little bit more food, other, other stuff, uh, uh, putting store all, all kinds of uh, medical stuff. And so we, we were in a little bit better position than a lot of other people. Well, that's good to hear. Next time your models or your crystal balls gives you that indication, <laughs> please let us know. Or at least pass on to Biddy and she can send it to the community. So Joe, the last time you and I were together actually with an Amherst group was in London in June of 2010. It was just after the financial crisis, of course, and you gave us an hour of your time to talk about your perspectives of the financial crisis as we were just coming out of it. What, as you think, reflect back to then and think about where we are today as it relates to markets, as it relates to some uh, economic behaviors, what is similar today and what is different? Well, the, the, the major difference that's uh, very striking is uh, that was a crisis that was a top-down crisis that began with uh, a failure of our financial system, uh, excessive risk, uh, that then became global in nature, uh, began in the United States, but, but uh, what, what became a world crisis. Uh, and affected every part uh, of our economy. Um, this is beginning very, obviously very different. Uh, it's not just a problem on demand, it's the supply, uh, it's uh, the disease, COVID-19. Uh, people don't want to buy, but they also don't want to get together to produce. Uh, in that sense, it's totally different. But there are some ad aspects that where there's some similarities. Uh, whenever you have a very deep downturn, no matter what its cause, uh, it eventually gets translated into a problem in demand. The fact that people aren't going to work, um, uh, that they can't work, uh, is going to mean that going forward, we are going to have a problem of insufficiency of aggregate demand, or what we would without uh, adequate government uh, intervention. Uh, it's even possible that we could have financial problems, this time not coming from the top down, but coming from the bottom up uh, as ordinary individuals can't pay their bills, uh, businesses can't pay their bills, 
uh, and uh, any protracted economic downturn winds up as a financial crisis. Uh, there's one other element of, of similarity. Uh, in the 2008 crisis, we became very aware of the way, ways in which markets don't you often work well. The markets uh, engaged in excessive risk taking, um, and we saw uh, that markets weren't resilient. The collapse of one bank led to the collapse of the whole financial system. So the market economy, as it had been constructed uh, over the preceding years, was not resilient. I think we're seeing some of that same thing today. Um, in a way, we created an economic system that was, again, focused very much on the short, uh, short term. Um, we were proud that we uh, had uh, so few hospital beds because we were using every hospital bed very efficient, efficiently. And that's fine uh, as long as nothing goes bad. But when you have a surge as we have now, uh, the problem of the shortage of hospital beds becomes a real crisis. You know, I, I have a metaphor describing it. We, uh, we took out the spare tires from our cars. Uh, the reasoning was most of the time you don't have a flat tire. So why carry the spare tire with you? But of course, when you have a flat tire, you really want the spare tire. The cost of not having that spare tire is enormous. So we didn't think about risk. Um, and this is true not only obviously in the private sector, in the public sector, the Trump administration uh, got rid of the Office of Pandemics that was supposed to prepare us against this risk. Uh, it underfunded to try to defund uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which are the mechanisms that we have for responding to crisis. The argument was, well, we are, aren't having a pandemic this year, so why fund it? So it, that kind of short-sightedness, which was very pervasive in markets and in some politicians, not in general, but in some politicians, has had a devastating effect on us. Thanks for that. You know, in, in, when some people reflected on the crisis, the financial crisis, some people thought, well, maybe the government didn't respond quick enough. Um, I think this time, uh, in terms of once the government figured out there was a problem, governments actually around the world started acting um, in different ways, depending upon you know where what part of the world they were in. Um, and in you know in terms of today, where we sit today, the financial contributions by the governments are significant. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the policy decisions that have been made. You know, how's Trump doing? How is the Fed doing? How's the Treasury doing? And maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, what do you think would be the positive results from it, but also then some of the distortions that could result from some of these policy decisions. So, you know, first, you, you were talking about uh, the speed of reacting. Uh, going back to the models that we were talking about of epidemics, one of the things you know is you have to act early. So if uh, the administration had listened to the scientists, uh, we would have acted earlier and we would have been better prepared. We would have had the test. We would have uh, uh, contained the growth of the disease. There would not have been the number of deaths that occur. And you see uh, in the state of Washington and state of California, uh, in Silicon Valley, where uh, the firms responded, there was a quick response as soon as that uptick uh, in incidents was seen, they responded and they contained uh, the disease. But nationally, uh, we didn't respond in a timely way. And quite frankly, thousands of people have died as a result of that untimely, uh, the failure to act in a timely way. Now, in terms of the, you might say the economic package, yeah. or I would say economic and health package, um, I would say we responded massively in terms of dollars. Uh, nobody can say $2.7 trillion is a little money. It's a lot of money. But 
it was not a well-designed program. And so what we've gotten out of it is a lot less than we should have given the amount of money uh, spent. Let me just give you a couple examples. Um, as we went into this crisis, America was uh, in some sense the least well-prepared of the advanced countries because we have the worst health conditions and in many ways the worst health system. I mean, in, we, at the top, we have the best, but life expectancy in the United States is lower than in the other advanced countries. Uh, the uh, life expectancy is not, uh, 2018, which is the latest data we have, is lower than it was uh, uh, in 2015. Uh, so things are not good. This particular disease is not an equal opportunity killer. It goes after people with poor health conditions. And we have a lot of those people because not only do we have on average a healthcare system that doesn't deliver, but it's a healthcare system marked by huge inequalities. Uh, some people do very well, but we all, the disparity in life expectancy is larger, much larger than in other advanced uh, countries. So one particular aspect uh, uh, of that uh, is that we are, we, have the, uh, we are the only advanced country that doesn't have a mandated pay sick leave policy. Hmm. Where that relates to this disease is you don't want sick people going to work because uh, if they don't, they have no income. And remember, part of the problem is that 40% of Americans uh, have, uh, are living paycheck to paycheck. And if they miss that paycheck, they can't buy food. They can't pay the rent. So in the absence of paid sick leave, they're going to be work. And if they're at work, they're spreading the disease. Now, at one level, Congress recognized this. And they passed a provision mandated, mandating paid sick leave. But then, under the influence of the major companies, they exempted 80% of American workers. So having recognized the principle, they then exempt 80%. And it, the poorest Americans are the ones who are particularly not only vulnerable, but most likely not to have paid sick leave as part of their compensation package. So that, that's an example of, of a really flawed policy. Let me give you a second example. Uh, and this again contrasts very uh, starkly with what's happened in Europe. Uh, the principle that you want to maintain people's connection with their employer is a very important. Uh, it means that you can restart the economy much quicker. Um, in America, it's particularly important because most Americans depend on their employer for health insurance. Uh, if they are, uh, lose that health insurance, they get put on Medicaid. The Medicaid system is not equipped to have a massive increase in uh, 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 the burden. Um, so, uh, and, and when workers get disconnected with their uh, employer, the productivity effects, wage effects are, are really significant. So the, everybody understood that it was really important to keep the connection with the workforce. You're figured out how to do it. You know, it's really interesting, Joe, because sitting here in Europe, uh, I'm quite close to the European approach to that issue. And you're absolutely right. It, across Europe, even though the decision was made by individual governments, the British government made their own decision, the French government made their own decision, the Belgian, et cetera, they all came to that same conclusion. And it worked. And now we see the data that uh, the increase in the unemployment rate in the United States, you know, 24 million in the last three weeks, is so much greater yeah. than in every other country. And we used to pride ourselves in having the most dynamic, flexible labor market, and it's the one now that's most afflicted. We knew what to do. 
let me make it very clear. I was talking to, you know, trying to put uh, things into the political process. The Democrats were very much aware of it. But unfortunately, there was enormous resistance to getting the kind of program that Denmark and uh, France and all the other countries, you know. So there was a model we could have used. And there was just resistance. And this comes then to uh, the third part, that uh, third example uh, of uh, this, where, where things have not gone very well. Uh, we wanted to maintain health. We wanted to protect the most vulnerable, and we didn't do that very well. We still haven't been able to get the paychecks out to um, uh, the lowest income Americans. Uh, the president said it could be done in two weeks. Now they're saying for those who are at the uh, at the bottom, who whose income is below the level that they had to fill a tax return out last year, yeah. that they may not get the checks until September. They're supposed to go for five months without any source of income. So we failed in that. We failed to protect uh, jobs. Um, the other thing is uh, creating the preconditions for a quick recovery. And that was money, getting money to the small businesses, particularly that needed, needed it. And that was the, what was called the PPP program. Yeah. Uh, that's been a disaster. Um, the, the money uh, didn't go to the small businesses. Um, the banks were paid to administer it, not to make judgments about who was credit worthy. That wasn't the issue. It was to be nothing more than electronic transfer of the forms from the government. When the government already has uh, all the information on every company and the IRS and the social security, because uh, they have to, they have that electronic information and they're getting paid more than $6 billion for just sending these electronic forms to the IRS, you know, and the, then the problem is the banks are frustrated because uh, the, the government is, is, uh, changing regulations, nobody knows what's going on. The the first tranche of money, um, three hundred and fifty billion dollars or so, went in thirteen days. They ran out of it, and the poorest, smallest firms. Uh, I I know you know talked to some of those firms. So frustrated, you know they got their application in right away. They couldn't get it through the banks. What you know what they said is the banks categorized people into two categories. Good customers, the bigger firms, and others. And so the construction companies, which were not listed as the most vulnerable, were the largest recipients uh, of money. Uh, and the second tranche, people are talking about that money will be gone in a couple of days. So the point is that program has been a disaster. And in the end, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars have gone out, and it was supposed to protect jobs. It didn't do that. Uh, and uh, that means going forward, I think when the pandemic is put under control, we, we can anticipate a rocky recovery. Let's build on that a little bit, Joe, because I think that's a really important point. This... Uh, what maybe you'd call an inefficient allocation of capital during this period of time will invariably lead to um, capital in the wrong places and will give some companies a, a second lease on life potentially and others who, who could benefit from the, the capital to grow won't have access to it. How do you think that does play out both in terms of the shape of a recovery, but also once we get through the recovery, the allocation of capital, then the cost of capital, um, for in, in its inefficient way, what kind of impact could that have ultimately on? Yeah, uh, and let me say one other thing: it's going to have a lot of effect on politics too, because the sense of injustice is very strong, and we saw a little bit of that after two thousand eight. I think we'll see another big dose of that uh, now. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, in the government 
through these programs is giving life and death to different companies. But it's not, and different sectors of the economy, but it's not doing it in a coherent way, in a way of prioritization. It's being left to the randomness of who has good bank connections, who gets their form into the government in this rush to get your, your form in uh, first. And that means capital is being massively misallocated. And but it's more than capital misallocating. These are life and death decisions for small enterprises. So we are we we're giving. Uh, I don't want to call it euthanasia because it's not it's not painless. We're giving a painful death to a lot of small firms, and then we're giving a lot of money to firms uh, that shouldn't be. We didn't do any sense of accountability, for instance, in saying, you know, if you got a big tax cut in 2018, you took that money and rather than create a capital buffer, you bought back shares so that you're in a more precarious position. They didn't say those firms, we're not gonna give you so much money. <laughs> you know, you're, you're in the predicament that you are because you make some bad decisions. There was no sense of accountability. So some firms are going down who did behave very badly. Uh, some firms are going down uh, who are being rescued uh, who behave very badly. It's a totally random uh, a process except for this issue of who has good connections, which is biased towards the rich and the large. So uh, to me, we're gonna emerge with a more distorted economy, more inequality than we had before. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think you know, it's going to have uh, long run costs. Let me just give you one example of the misalloc, two examples of the misallocation of funds, um, which uh, I think uh, absolutely, the, the first may sound a little self-serving since I work at Columbia, but that is uh, one of the sectors of our economy, of our society, that's very important, is higher education. Um, and to a very large extent, the strength of America depends on science, on uh, uh, investments in education and higher education. It's in many ways, one of the strongest sectors of the US economy. Uh, it's why we have done so well. And uh, the higher education sector is going to be suffering very, very seriously. Every one of their sources of revenue is being attacked. Uh, the endowment, contributions, uh, tuition, uh, enrollment, you know, the whole thing, it's, 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 it's a disaster. Um, and yet almost no money is being given to protect the higher education sector. Um, the, you know, a few of our uh, institutions of higher learning got some money, which they said was going to go for fellowships, scholarships for poor students. And the administration attacked even there was money going to these universities for poor students. Um, you know, so, so that's one sector that's suffering. The other sector that's really suffering a lot is uh, the state and local governments. Uh, an important, you know, one third of all of the public sector is state and localities. Uh, it's a very big sector. The 2008 crisis, the decline in tax revenues of the states was twice, almost twice that of the GDP. If anything like that happens now, we know how much GDP is going to go, likely go down much larger than before. Their tax revenues, income, profits, taxes are going to go, sales taxes, that's going to plummet. All the states have balanced budget frameworks. That means that when the revenues go down, they have to have cutback expenditures. That means 
that unless they get assistance from the federal government, there are going to be enormous cutbacks. And states provide education, health, general welfare. They're 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 central to our society. They've been central to the response to the pandemic, and uh, they are going to be uh, 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 really constrained. And it will mean that we will not have a robust recovery because they're going to have to fire workers, a lot of workers. And um, a striking statistic is that after 2008, so many workers were fired from the public sector in the States. It led, it's a kind of austerity, which you know about in Europe. It's an austerity that comes not from the federal government, but austerity imposed by the federal government on the stakes. And so we're going to be experiencing that austerity and our unemployment rate is going to go way up just because of this. I want to build on that a little bit, Joe, because as you point out from a European perspective, the whole the political decision making process is quite different because once you have in a parliamentary type system, for example, once you have a government, the government can make its decision. It's, there's a lot less negotiating between the executive and Congress, et cetera. So decision making is a little faster, a little bit cleaner. And then you also don't have the, the differences between the federal government and the state government. So you spent a bunch of time doing in the government. You chaired Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. What do you think, how do we get through some of that? Because some of the, both the time lost and the inefficiency in the decision-making combine with the risk that you just pointed out, which is if there is not a strong supportive relationship between the federal government and the state and local governments, that could significantly uh, delay the recovery. Well, you know, this is a, a central question on fiscal federalism. And uh, if we had a more cooperative spirit, uh, uh, you know, a more typical politics where you face a crisis and everybody says, let's pull together. Uh, this was a kind of an occasion where, you know, in a normal government, you would have said, Look at uh, you, stakes. You're closer to what's going on. We're going to give you a lot of responsibility for doing it, for for making decisions. But we know you have fiscal constraints, and uh, we, as a result of that, we're going to have a kind of we're going to help the stakes that are most affected, both on the expenditure side and the revenue side. You know. This principle of, of shared responsibility has been a mark of bipartisan support. It was part of Nixon uh, administration. We've had it for a very long time. So, uh, you know, we could have done it. Um, I mean, it's a little, little bit uh, more complicated uh, in the United States and in other countries. But uh, it's not that complicated to say uh, in this current context, just let's compensate the states for the loss of revenue and the extra COVID-19 expenditures. A simple formula, a one-line bill that could do it. You know, maybe it'll take five pages. But we're not talking about a 500, 800-page bill like, like we had. Uh, this is not complicated. Uh, and it should have been at the basis of where, you know, what is the best way to use the instruments of government to deal with a problem that we individually can't deal with? We're going to need collective action at some level. And in some sense, uh, it's the mayors and the governors that are at the forefront of this, of this fight. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that have to be done at the national level making sure that the tests are available, making sure that there's a supply of masks. You know, those are things that have to be done at the national level. The supply, the national stockpile, the CDC. There are certain things that have to be done at the national level. We haven't done those, but we also haven't provided the support for the stakes and localities to do the part of the job that they need to do. 
All right, I want to shift focus a little bit. You know, Biddy mentioned your recent book, People, Power, and Profits, Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent. And in that book, you argue for something you call progressive capitalism. I think it's very related to some of the topics that you're raising now. Um, and you describe it as a system that basically shares benefits more evenly, more fairly across the population, um, all while can still encourage growth. So tell us a little bit more about this because you've, you've kind of touched the inequities uh, that we're seeing right now. And tell us, where do we go from here if we wanted to embrace a more progressive capitalism, particularly given some of the challenges around the politics of it all? Yeah, well, um, you know, some people, when I came out with the book Progressive Capitalism, some people said uh, that's an oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> my view was no, uh, any uh, well-functioning society of the complexity of ours has to have some degree of decentralization. A key part of that has to be the market economy, capitalism, but it can't be unfettered capitalism that hasn't been working for very large fractions of our population. And that's why I use the term progressive capitalism, try to evoke the uh, uh, progressive era at the end of the 19th century, where once before we realized capitalism wasn't working for most citizen, citizens and we had these progressive reforms. I guess I would identify uh, two aspects of this that, that are absolutely critical. I begin the book by, by saying, uh, why is it that we have a higher standards of living, so much higher today than we did 250 years ago? Uh, um, what, can, what can account for that? Or another way of putting it, what is the real source of the wealth of nations? Why are we so much better off? And the answer very simply is the advances in science our understanding of nature and the advances of social science, understanding how we can coordinate, cooperate, work together uh, in a complex society. And these two advances are really foundational to our, our progress. And uh, behind them, of course, are systems of ascertaining the truth, verifying the truth, discussing it, but it's basically uh, knowledge uh, in the end. Um, and the second point is that a well-functioning society is a, a requires a balance between the market stakes and civil society, and that we've lost that balance. And part of that balance is you need governments uh, to make investments in science, infrastructure, education, you need government to regulate. Uh, you need government for social protection. You need government to act collectively when we have to act, uh, do things that are beyond what are individually able to do. So in many ways, this crisis illustrates very forcefully uh, those themes. Just to mention uh, two examples, when the pandemic uh, occurred, it was very clear that it was beyond the ability of any of us individually to deal with it. We turned to government. We had to turn to government. Uh, and uh, economists will use the word externality. When people are out spreading the disease, they're imposing costs on others that they don't take into account. And so this is a, like climate change, a, a, a classic example of, of an externality. And that's why we have to have uh, uh, government regulation. We need government help for dealing with the risks that are beyond our uh, uh, the market's capability of handling these risks. We turn to government because markets are not simply up to the task. But the second thing is we turn to science. It was science that enabled us so quickly to identify what was the source of people dying. Science identified the, the particular virus. And now, you know, the, the pace of what is going on and developing a, a virus, uh, antiviral, uh, figuring out how to control uh, the contagion is absolutely fantastic. Epidemiologists, 
social scientists, physicists, chemists are all working together all over the world. And, you know, we wish it happened faster, but the reality is if it weren't for science, this would have been much more like the Black Plague. <laughs> and so we, we, we really should appreciate uh, what science has contributed and recognize that what's been happening, the defunding of science has put us a, a, and the weakening of our social, our protection aspects like the CDC have put us at much greater risk and undermined our ability to respond to this uh, uh, pandemic and this risk to our economy and to our health. We're getting a number of questions from the community. So before we turn to those, let me just build on this last point because you talked about potentially two positives that are coming, that could come out of this. One is a better appreciation for the role governments can play. And two, a better appreciation and need for science, an investment in science. And science and knowledge more broadly, but science particularly, yeah. What else could we be hopeful for? What other positives could that could come out of this? Well, I think uh, two other things that might come out of this, I, I talked in the very beginning about are coming to understand the limitations of the market that we've not created a resilient system. It was too short-sighted. Uh, we, we can, you know, like 2008, we, we need to think a little bit more how to make our economic system more resilient, uh, more, thinking more, uh, more long-term. And the second thing I think uh, is uh, thinking about uh, the many aspects of, uh, of globalization. Um, you know, climate change made it very clear that we share one planet. Uh, I used to joke that, that the carbon dioxide molecules didn't carry visas and didn't carry passports and wherever they originate, they go all over the world and they cause climate change all over the world. And of course this virus also doesn't recognize boundaries. It doesn't carry a visa, it doesn't carry passports and it's a global problem. And both of these have to be solved globally. If there's any part of the world in which the pandemic is raging, it's a threat to the rest of the world. So we need global cooperation. And um, policies that undermine multilateralism are going exactly in the wrong direction. You know, one example of, of a kind of policy that will come back and bite us is uh, the US has talked about uh, putting restraints on the export of medical supplies. And you can understand that except if you look at the data and you realize that America imports so many more medical supplies that we're dependent on than we export. So if what other countries reciprocate and do what we're doing, if we set the role model for them, then we're gonna be in a big pickle because uh, we are so more dependent on others than they are on us. So this is just one example of, of global cooperation. Um, right now, there is a, a big effort uh, being made uh, within the IMF to generate $500 billion in what are called special drawing rights. Uh, it's a, a way that the IMF creates money that can give resources to the developing countries, emerging markets that may wind up being hit much worse than we've been. Uh, they don't have the healthcare systems. They're packed together. Uh, their health is weaker. Uh, they don't have the economic resources. So uh, it's imperative. And so far, the US uh, has been an impediment to uh, the provision of this assistance. Uh, you know, hopefully, we'll be able to persuade. It's in our self interest that uh, this uh, be done. So I think one of the other things that I hope, hope comes out of this is a better understanding that uh, we, we, we do live, we share one planet and we have to learn about how to cooperate 
and we have to support our multilateral institutions well, that that help us work together to address these global problems. It's a really interesting point, Joe, because as you know, one of the conclusions some people are taking from this is quite the contrary. This is evidence that we all need our own supply chains. We all need to make our own decisions. Goes back to, of course, duplicative uh, investment across a lot of different countries and across companies. How do we kind of balance that concern with the one you just raised? Well, I mean, you're right. We, we became too reliant on global supply chains that were not sufficiently diversified and resilient. So that was a mistake, and that's very much linked with the point I made before, lack of resilience. Yeah. But going the other extreme of saying self-reliant, we can't be self-reliant. You know, some of the critical raw materials that we use in our cell phone, in, in the, uh, to make it uh, possible to have the Zoom conference, uh, come from developing countries. So the reality is that a modern technology requires interdependence. So we have to manage that interdependence, manage it better than we have. And that's what, what, what I, I wanted to emphasize, the, the need for cooperation but it's also the point that you raised. We also need to make sure that we have a higher degree of resilience yeah. uh, than we've had in the past. Good. Well, thanks for that. So let me turn to some questions from the community, if I can. Um, this one has come up a bunch. Given all the um, support from the government and the Fed, uh, the national debt is growing a lot. We, I guess we came into this well north of $20 trillion and it's only growing. Um, how are we going to, how's the U.S. going to be able to pay that down? Does it matter if they pay it down or not? And what's the balance sheet look like if there's another crisis uh, in the future? Yeah, I don't know if you know, the CBO just a couple of days ago came out with the estimate that our debt GDP ratio will be 101% by September. Uh, I'm not greatly worried. Uh, let me say the, the first priority is getting us over the pandemic and uh, that, uh, uh, you know, there's no economy uh, to save, then we don't have to worry about the debt. So let's first thing, let's save the economy, let's save our people. Uh, and those are the first uh, two priorities. Um, I think we have to go back and think about World War II. When we fought World War II, we didn't ask, could we afford it? We said, we had no choice. We made the right decision. Uh, there wasn't a lot, you know, it, it was debt. And we wound up at the end of World War II uh, with a debt GDP ratio of 135%. Like this, uh, it wasn't debt that was spent, money that was spent in uh, increasing our infrastructure. Uh, we had some things to sow for. There were a lot of advances in science but it was basically munitions that got destroyed. We didn't have anything to show for it. But our response to that was not the kind of policies that Europe has done, which is austerity. The Eisenhower and Truman took the view that the right way to deal with the debt was to grow the economy. You know, you talk about the debt GDP ratio, there's a numerator and there's a denominator. And what they said is, let's focus on the denominator. If we can get GDP up, the debt GDP ratio will go down. And that's why under Eisenhower, we had the massive highway program, massive research programs, massive education programs. You know, it was uh, uh, a very successful set of programs that led in a, you know, uh, 15 so years, the debt GDP ratio went down from 135 down to 45% GDP. We had cooperation from the Fed, keeping interest rates low, that was called the accord. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it worked. And I think that's the lesson that we ought to learn, that we ought to begin from a focus on expanding GDP. Now, what some people worry about is, well, won't that 
be inflationary. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, I'm actually worried about uh, just the opposite, a deficiency in aggregate demand for two reasons. A lot of households and firms are going to see their balance sheets devastated, especially because of the randomness of the way that the $2.7 trillion is being given. Um, and secondly, the nature of this disease is uh, we don't know whether it's going to come back, you know, whether there's going to be a second wave, a third wave. Uh, we don't know even whether uh, the antibodies, how long they last. Uh, there's just a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, we've never been through an economic trauma like the trauma that we've just been through. Well, the implication of all of this is there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty leads to precautionary behavior. That means low consumption, low investment. So I'm more worried about a deficiency in aggregate demand that will require more stimulus, uh, not uh, inflation. If we're wrong, what I think is we have to monitor it very carefully. And uh, if, if that turns out to be wrong, what we need to do clearly is increase taxes. And uh, we have a lot of scope for increasing taxes in ways that would actually strengthen the economy, environmental taxes, uh, increasing uh, corporate profits taxes, monopoly taxes, lots of scope for uh, natural resource taxes, lots of uh, we, that we can raise that will actually uh, stimulate the economy in certain key areas. Well, so if you take your premise as there will probably be less demand coming out of this and probably an ongoing role for government action here, both in terms of from the Fed's perspective, keeping interest rates low, and then the, the government, federal government supporting um, investment of sorts. You talked about potentially infrastructure. And then very in the beginning of the conversation, I said I'd come back to this. You know, some of the learnings from, for example, the efficiency that you mentioned of being able to sit in Manhattan and do a lot of your meetings via Zoom and spend less time on planes and other ways you used to spend time. So if you think about the combination of the role for the government to help us get out of this and some changing both demand drivers and behavioral factors, what industries do you think should be prioritized to the extent the government can do that um, and why? And then how would we do that while at the same time making sure we don't, you know, bomb out some other industries that still employ a lot of people? So, so first of all, let me say, you know, I think one of the pivotal uh, things we have to do is the green transition. This is an existential threat to our planet. So uh, if I, you know, the first priority right now is uh, the investments need to be green investments to help shift the basis of our economy uh, to re renewable uh, energy and to uh, energy conservation. Uh, that will entail a lot of innovation. I think that it's going to make us much more dynamic. But that would be one set of priorities I would put very high on the agenda. Uh, the second thing is, we're transitioning to increasingly to a knowledge economy. And, uh, you know, part of that is supporting our knowledge institutions. Uh, that goes back to, to the problems that I talked about uh, uh, before. The third thing is, I think uh, we have to address uh, some of the deep weaknesses in our society, uh, uh, the inequalities, the disparities, and health and income and wealth uh, that we face. Um, you know, that's a rich agenda that uh, is a lot for us to do that would really stimulate the economy. So that's the framework. I mean, I've, but as we do that, I think the point Dave, that you made is important. Uh, there are some people who will lose their job as we make this transition. Uh, we're probably going to be traveling a little bit less than we did before. We've discovered that uh, 
the wear and tear on our body is a little bit less on, with Zoom than it is on an airplane. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to do some airplane travel, but I don't think we'll get back to where we were uh, before. So um, that the markets do not do a good job in that kind of restructuring. Uh, one of the things that we've learned, uh, the people who lose their income typically don't have the resources to make the investments in human capital that are necessary to move to the new sectors. They may, the new jobs may be in a different place from the old jobs. So that transition is extraordinarily difficult. And we are going to need assistance in helping the economy make that structural transformation. So uh, I think uh, we have to bear that in mind as we think about the priorities, uh, among the priorities of protecting those people who who are going to be structured structured out uh, as we make that structural transformation. We build on transformation. Here's an interesting question: Do you think the virus and how it's spread could impact um, some of the migration and growth toward major urban centers that we've been seeing of for the for a while now? Um, and if so, how would you advise cities to respond to that? Uh, I think we will have learned a lot about contagion and about health. So, you know, I think there will be some social norms that will change. Shake, uh, handshaking is a medieval custom that will have finally come to an end, will be more elbow uh, and foot tapping, and, and there will be other changes. You know, I think we'll learn uh, the washing the hands will be much more deeply ingrained. Uh, uh, so there are things like that uh, that will change. Um, the humans are social beings. Uh, the agglomeration advantages in terms of knowledge of people being together, it's all, you know, the cities have always been the center of, of the you know, where knowledge is bubbling up. And uh, we may have a more diversified, you know, not all the concentration in the way we may have, but I think cities will continue to be very important part of uh, the structure of our society. So uh, it may be that we will have to think a lot about how we, maintain more distances within the city. But I think the uh, advantages of cities, of the interactions, which are so much part of our being, and especially part of a knowledge economy, are, are just so great that, that I, I think we'll figure it out. Well, here's a question that I think many people want to know. It's our own little version of either Scrabble or alphabet soup. So what do you think the recovery is going to look like? Is it a V? Is it a W, a U, or dare I say an L? And then someone asked, is there any chance we can avoid a major depression? Yeah. So, so yes, there is a ch chance we'll avoid a major depression if we put in place the right policies. Uh, you know, a depression that we had was uh, a lack of aggregate demand. Uh, and we know how to stimulate demand now. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, if we don't give the assistance to the states uh, and localities, we will have a serious economic downturn. If we leave some important sectors like the higher education sector behind, there's going to be unemployment in those sectors. And that will, through a multiplier process, uh, uh, be magnified. Um, so. Let me say, we have a knowledge of how to avoid a depression, and it's only the politics, and I think uh, uh, we should have a resolve not to allow this to develop into a depression. Um, there are a set of problems that we haven't confronted since World War II, which is supply-side shortages in the short run. And we saw that in the case of masks, uh, we're beginning to see it in the case of certain uh, 
foods. Um, you know, in the early indication, price of rice may have increased two or threefold in the wholesale markets. So, I mean, there, there, there are uh, problems that are very significant. In World War II, we stepped up and we figured out we, we had to use rationing. Hmm. Um, and we ought to be thinking about, uh, you know, in the allocation of masks, we would have been a lot better if we had a more rational way of making sure that the people who really needed it in the hospitals got the mask rather than leaving it to the highest bidder. So in, in, in the context that we have, you know, the markets are not the best way of sorting out these problems. And, and sometimes we have to do things that are unusual. We wouldn't want it as part of our normal life, but this is not part of normal. Now, in terms of the uh, shape, um, I think uh, there is uh, a high likelihood of a second wave, possibly a third wave. Uh, the uh, other countries have had that second wave. Um, if you look at the dynamics of the disease, uh, it grows sort of exponentially. Um, and so social isolation, quarantine has gotten the numbers down, but once it opens up, if we haven't succeeded in social distancing enough, if we start interacting too much, the interaction effects will mean that it will start to grow again. And uh, we know that. Uh, and so we know that the, there is a significant probability that the numbers will start growing again. And we will respond to that by having another clampdown. So the fact that there might be what you call W seems quite, quite possible. What worries me is not the W so much as the, when you talk about the W, there's the V shape at the second part of the W. I don't think it's gonna be a V shape at the second part of the W. That may be a long L shape if we don't get things right. So if a lot of small businesses go bankrupt, if our municipalities and stakes are in bad shape, if our higher education institutions are in bad shape, um, I could very easily see a long slog getting out of the pandemic. Do you think, Joe, that once we're through the pandemic, there'll be a kind of post-pandemic accounting of who were good actors and who were not? How will history look back on not just the policy decisions that were made, but how people reacted to them, corporations, other institutions, individuals? Oh, inevitably. I mean, that's the nature of history. Uh, and, and there's a whole profession of historians saying, uh, you know, uh, counterfactuals. What would have happened if only we had done such and such? Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a particularly uh, going to be, I would say, both contentious and difficult issue. Uh, you know, uh, the standard uh, story of accountability is who knew what when and should have acted. Uh, and clearly, there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we hadn't experienced anything like this before. But that having been said, uh, China, Korea, Singapore went through it before we did. Italy was going through it before we did. We had lots to learn from. And we have a lot wide body of scientific information about previous epidemics, uh, SARS. And we had a very well-developed theory of epidemiology, that what I referred to when you asked me in the beginning. So we had actually a, a wide body of knowledge that even though we hadn't been through this particular thing before, uh, we've been through things that had a lot of similarity. 
So if we had done uh, what we should have done, which is at the national level, assembled the wisest people, the best scientists, the best epidemiologists, the best doctors, and said, what can we learn? And, and brought them from other countries and said, you know, what has what your experience been? You know, uh, uh, China could do things in quarantine that we couldn't in our democracy. But uh, why were they doing it? And, you know, if you can't do that, what would you have done as a second best? Uh, there was a lot that we could have learned if we had only asked those questions. And then if we had a science-based policy, looking at what was going on in Italy and Korea and Singapore, uh, we would have been able, I think, uh, to have responded so much better. And as I said before, I think so many thousands of lives would have been saved. So I, I, I do think that uh, when history was written, uh, the judgments will be harsh um, because even though there was a lot of decisions being made with a lot of uncertainty, we knew a lot, but we didn't marshal the scientific evidence that we had in ways that would have protected us as well as it could have. Thank you for that. Well, I want to bring it a little bit closer to home to Amherst now. Um, there's been a lot of speculation with uh, remote learning and all that, that things will change a lot in the world of higher education. Um, how do you think this crisis will impact higher education? And do you think the future of schools like Amherst is, is certain? Is there risk? Will Amherst thrive as a result of this? How do you think about that? Well, I think I, I'd like to come back to what we've been talking about, uh, the importance of knowledge. And almost I would say the importance of a liberal arts education because um, what we needed was not only science, but we had to think about the social interactions, what were gonna to happen to poor people if they couldn't get to work. Um, we were making decisions about the interactions, uh, the design of a whole society uh, with an awareness of our health system, with an awareness of uh, the social inequalities uh, that were pre-existing. So, that kind of broad view that you need science, you need public health, but you also needed a broader perspective. I think that was uh, something that's essential. I think it's the kind of thing that a liberal arts education is particularly uh, good at uh, 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 engendering. So to me, um, I think that uh, the value of higher education will be enhanced, the value of a liberal arts education will be enhanced, you know, not for everybody, but there is clearly an important part uh, of the role for this in our society. Um, I think the economics of it for the next few years are gonna be very difficult. Uh, I mentioned before, all the revenue streams of universities are being hit. Um, Amherst is not as dependent uh, as many others on tuition from foreign students. And those that are very dependent on foreign students are very worried that the foreign students won't come. Uh, and, uh, you know, particularly uh, in the context of the kind of, of atmosphere that's sometimes been created of uh, uh, um, anti-foreign uh, atmosphere. So um, uh, I think we're going to go through a, a difficult time. Not Amherst so much, but some of our universities that do depend on, on foreign students whose endowments are not quite so large, who before the crisis were in a more fragile uh, position. Um, how well they do how many survive, and I think some of them will not survive, 
uh, will depend on the kind of assistance that is provided. Uh, you know, you talked to before what are priority sectors, and I believe that knowledge in a knowledge economy <laughs> has to be a priority sector. So it ought to be given, but they didn't have the lobbyists that the airline industry had. And so they didn't get, you know, we would have been able to, what we spent in saving three airlines would have transformed American higher education. So, you know, you, it gives you a sense of, of, we were talking about the allocation of money, uh, money that went to three airlines could have supported the whole entire uh, American higher education system and really a misallocation, I think, uh, of resources. Um, I think uh, there will be changes. I, I, I think uh, we'll probably do more classes uh, online learning. Um, we, there, there are contexts in which it works. Uh, there are global seminars that I've participated in that have been very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 700 people on Monday uh, discussing the economics uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, from all over the world. So, you, you know, it, the, these are actually uh, new communities uh, being created. But in the end, uh, I think all of us who've taught online miss being in the classroom with our students. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same for the teacher. It's not the same for the students. And so I think that the kind of education where you're in uh, a small room with a small number of students interacting um, is, uh, you know, uh, is just vital. And I think we'll go back to that. Well, that's a great lead into my last question uh, for the day. Um, you spend a lot of time at a number of great universities, as Biddy mentioned. You've traveled the world. Let's stick to Amherst. What do you miss most about your time at Amherst? Well, I I suppose uh, you know I, I, it's hard to name one thing. You, know, you you think about your friends that you had in college. Uh, I think a lot about my teachers uh, and how much I learned from them. Uh, we spent a unit in our uh, global, uh, world history course talking about what we called encounters, which was the early version of globalization. So when I started to write about globalization, I reflected a lot on what I'd learned in my uh, Amherst class. Uh, as a freshman and sophomore about encounters, about the globalization over time. And it really did shape my mind in a, in a very inf important way. And I, I think I, I brought a perspective that a lot of people who haven't gone through that historical, uh, uh, these, those historical studies. But in the end, I guess I, the, what brings me back the nostalgia is uh, the setting. The beauty, uh, the uh, uh, looking down uh, from Memorial Hill, uh, the fall and the leaves, uh, walking through the woods. Uh, so I think in, in the end, uh, it, it, it's the beauty of Amherst uh, that, that I miss now. And, um, you know, one of the things I enjoy so much about being on the trustees, besides having uh, wonderful fellow trustees uh, that that uh, have stayed friends, uh, is uh, going up uh, four times a year and seeing Amherst in all the seasons uh, and and going for those walks uh, through the woods. Well, thanks for that. I think that's a memory that we all share, and I think we're all looking forward to getting out of our houses and our apartments and finding our way back on campus. So with that, Joe, thank you for your time. I'm gonna turn it uh, back to Biddy. I, I do wanna give a, a shout out to Austin and Davis in the Amherst events team that helped make this all happen and to Andy with JX2 who helped us with the technology. So thank you, 
Jen, for that as well. Biddy, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Joe. I, I can't thank the two of you enough. That was an extraordinary nearly hour and a half. Um, just amazing. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, and I urge any of you um, who are interested, please, to join us on Thursday at 7.30 in the evening, at least our time, Dave, a little <laughs> later in London, um, when we'll have a uh, Nobel Prize winning biologist, Harold Varmus, and former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, David Kessler, in conversation with Shirley Tillman, herself a cell biologist, a member of our board of trustees, and the former president of Princeton. And many of the same issues will uh, emerge, I'm sure. Thanks again. This was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.